Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, yesterday, Francis took me aside and said in very earnest terms, I very much want you to give a good talk, Henry. <laughs> I said, well, I, I will do the best I can. I can't promise anything. I think it's an unrealistic expectation. <laughs> People have unrealistic expectations from time to time in our society, and that reminded me actually of a bumper sticker that I saw here some time back. It said in clear block letters, U.S. out of North America. <laughs> Without arguing the merits of that case or the lack of merit, it did seem like Francis' suggestion to be somewhat unrealistic. <laughs> the uh, subject of the t talk today, uh, the subject certainly is, is well known, I'm sure, to most of you in the audience. It is a series of experiments that were carried out at Stanford by a, an MIT Slack collaboration uh, that started in the early 1960s, started to take data in the deep inelastic reaction in 1968 and wound down in the early 70s rather slowly. It was a, a very interesting series of experiments for the people in it. We en enjoyed it enormously at the time. Uh, we're aware of how much fun it was to do that. Part of this uh, has to do with the, uh, wh what uh, Martin and other people, Martin Deutsch in his earlier talk and others referred to as the golden age. And if you remember the uh, rather poignant financial diagram that Bill Wallenmeyer showed at lunch the other day, you remember that the funds uh, in what I refer to as the golden age climbed up in, in the period up to about 1970 and then coasted down again and leveled out for some years. So the golden age is uh, associated at least in some part, with another translation of the word gold, which is gelt, which was the funds that kept it all going. And it, it really was, in many ways, uh, an era which had, for a period, apparently unlimited possibilities. The MIT Slack collaboration was the collaboration. Part of this was initiated by Jerry and um, myself. In the early 1960s, we had both worked at Stanford and been on the Stanford faculty uh, working in Robert Hofstadter's group on electron scattering. And we, uh, when the large machine, the two-mile accelerator, was, was being contemplated and, in fact, uh, construction plans were being laid, we wrote uh, Pief Panofsky a letter and said we would like to join in that group, uh, almost all of whom were our old friends. Well, it was not just the two of us that were involved. Uh, this is a list of the collaborators in that. And I've taken the liberty, because this is an LNS uh, camp gathering, to underline in red those people who, who either were at MIT at the time of the collaboration or had been educated at MIT. And you could see there were enough of us so the Slack people could not reliably get away with anything. We were, we, Jerry and I particularly, were enormously well, bountifully supported, uh, not just uh, in financially, uh, although that seemed to be the tenor of the time, but also in some sociological sense by the physics department under uh, then Chairman Bill Buckner, whom many of us remember. Uh, he basically uh, allowed Jerry and me to become a single hyphenated professor in the department and we were able to split the travel uh, to Slack uh, between us uh, in any way we chose. Uh, I, being single at the time, uh, over not quite 10 years, uh, spent nearly a third of my time out there. It was one of the first big heavy-duty collaborations that people in the physics department had engaged in, and it, it set the tone for a lot of the subsequent uh, good collaborations that have occurred between uh, LNS people and uh, work at distant accelerators. Now, the 
uh, to begin to lead into the subject of electron scattering, uh, b both of us, Jerry and I, as I said, had been with Hofstadter's group. Hofstadter's uh, principal and quite great contribution was to study the elastic scattering of high energy electrons from the proton and from the neutron. And in uh, summary, uh, the sort of thing he found was that as you increase the momentum transfer, the observed scattering cross-sections coasted down uh, much faster with <coughs> momentum transfer than one would expect from the scattering of a point charge. And this is due directly to the uh, fact that as you increase the momentum transfer, the contributions to the outgoing wave uh, from components distributed over space interfere more and more and give you this dramatic decrease. And this is interpreted and was interpreted at the time as the result of the finite distribution and finite structure of the proton. And at later experiments have carried that curve out further. And unlike the nuclear atom, there was no hint in this uh, extended data of any hard single center in the proton. And there were physicists who concluded publicly that therefore the proton had no hard constituents and no core in it, at least certainly not a single core. Now the reaction which we uh, studied was the inelastic uh, scattering of electrons. This is the Feynman diagram for them. The Electron uh, travels along here in vacuum. There's a single interaction. Here comes the proton. There is some momentum transfer, which is, uh, can in the laboratory be adjusted so that one knows what it is. There is an energy transfer, just the difference between the incoming and outgoing electron energies. And there is some amount of energy communicated to the uh, proton, or neutron as the case may be, uh, in simply uh, blowing it up. And that becomes, in the inelastic case, a, uh, a variable which is subject to adjustment. And you study various, uh, you study the cross sections over a range of inelasticities. This is a set of all purpose equations that uh, govern the process. Uh, because the, in, the elastic scattering, is unique in that there is uh, no energy communicated to the struck system except recoil energy. The uh, inelasticity here uh, has a uh, unique value, which is uh, for that reaction alone. Momentum transfer is given here. I don't uh, need to go over these, these equations in detail, uh, except to note one or two features that I'll come to in a, in, later and use in, uh, in some of the later slides that the, uh, much of the development of the central scattering equation depends on known quantum electrodynamics and is, is not a subject of investigation. But the unknown structure of the target system uh, is buried in these two functions, W2 and W1, uh, each of them, in principle, a function of two variables, the inelasticity nu and the momentum transfer. Now, without going into the details of it, uh, if you look at the scattering in terms of virtual, transverse, and longitudinal photons, there is a quantity of interest which uh, was measurable in, in the, some of the later stages of our experiments, which is uh, conventionally called R, the ratio of the uh, longitudinal to the transverse yields. And it turned out uh, as, we will see in a minute uh, to be useful to determine that because of the role it played in de uh, the uh, validity of some of the models. Now, it's one thing to uh, write down a Feynman diagram that is uh, simply paperwork, but to get at the heart of these measurements, you need equipment. And this is not Martin Deutsch's tabletop equipment anymore. Uh, here is the two-mile linear accelerator at Stanford. This is Route 285, which is indeed out of the radiation field. It is also not true that the San Andreas Fault 
cuts across the accelerator line. It is, in fact, a quarter of a mile from the gun. This uh, machine, the actual accelerator itself, is roughly 40 feet underground. Uh, was at the time and may still be the single largest single cantilevered structure that the human race has constructed. And at the time it, where the device was built, it was certainly the most precise machine of any sort that had been built. The uh, beams uh, after the acceleration was completed, which uh, would be below that point roughly on the diagram, were sent into a beam switchyard and could be uh, uh, energy analyzed and deflected into one of, of several laboratories. Uh, this early picture uh, d does not show the colliding beam facilities that were installed later. Our experiments were done with a deflection toward the north into this rather large 250-foot uh, shielded building. These beams are biologically very potent, and the whole building was heavily shielded. One could not go in it uh, during machine operation. The emergent beam uh, came out through a pipe here and then was buried in the hill. This hill never got the uh, quixotic names that the earlier hill had in the high energy physics laboratory where it was called Mount Panofsky. And rumors were that giant mutant frogs would lope around uh, in the evening, uh, having been affected by the radiation. Uh, you will instantly recognize this diagram as an experimentalist's Feynman diagram. And like the earlier Feynman diagram, the initial beam comes down here in vacuum, uh, in our case in an aluminum pipe. I'm tempted to refer to it as the false vacuum, but it really isn't. It's an imperfect vacuum. Uh, electrons are deflected in a hydrogen target there uh, into a large one or another magnetic spectrometer, which were built for the purpose. Uh, the detector arrays enable one to determine the precise scattering angle. Actually, a, a number of scattering angles were accepted by the equipment and determined by the detectors. The uh, recoil system in our experiments was let go by itself. We did ma made no attempt to do coincidences or to study it at all. This is just one diagram of, of the, uh, one of the two large detectors that we used. They were fairly substantial devices. Uh, the beams, primary beams came down here and were uh, measured, uh, brought to foci, uh, their intensities determined, uh, positions monitored, and so forth with liquid hydrogen targets. They were sort of typically nine, nine inches or a foot in diameter or so, some smaller, some larger. And an upward a double uh, flat, uh, flat magnet bend into a substantial shielded detector housing. These devices are not large now by the uh, conventional de uh, detector sizes used at the colliders, but at the time they were, uh, they were very large instruments. Uh, weighing of the order the sh with the shielding of uh, several thousand tons. These things opened up like clamshells, giving us access to the, <clears throat> to the elements. MIT uh, did uh, much of the detector uh, design and construction, as well as the electronic systems in the counting house. Now, let, let us leave the experimenters to their the switches and fuses for a minute and turn to a, uh, a theoretical interlude, which I'll call the 1968 Hadron, which is the, uh, the scene, so to speak, at the time our experiment started. As far as the experimental situation was concerned in the late 1950s and 1960s, there had been uh, a remarkable a series of discoveries that involved uh, identifying uh, dozens of hadrons, hadronic resonances at the strong interaction machines. There had been uh, quite a body of work done studying pion and proton scattering from nucleon targets. And the energies not being as high as are now available, 
it turns out that those the studies showed what you would call soft constituents and soft interactions, na namely cross sections which decreased exponentially with uh, increasing uh, mom perpendicular momentum, and uh, the coupled with the Hofstadter results, the general picture of the hadron was of a rather soft uh, device uh, which uh, underwent uh, what you would call soft interactions. On the, uh, uh, it, with respect to classification, uh, Murray Gelman and others had uh, helped elaborate the so-called eightfold way, which had uh, uh, classified these numerous uh, new discoveries into uh, identifiable and sorted arrays. And in 1964, Gelman and in independently George Swig proposed that the basis for these classification schemes uh, could be, con a basis could be constructed with a mathematical entity which uh, Murray uh, called quark. There's been some uh, discussion about the origin of the name, and from its inventor I will tell you that he invented the name first out of uh, blue sky as a word, just a sound, uh, which he would have spelled Q-U-O-R-K. Uh, later, he found the word used in, uh, I think it was what, Finnegan's Way, and he adopted that spelling but retained the old uh, pronunciation, so that's where it came from. Uh, they had the unusual property of having fractional, requiring fractional charges, and the, it was quite a successful scheme theoretically. The proposal of quark stimulated a number of quark searches, which went on for a number of years. And quarks were searched for in cosmic rays without success. They were uh, searched for in by uh, as hopefully being produced in accelerators and identified there without success. And they were searched for in an array of experiments uh, reminiscent of the Millikan oil drop experiment, searching for char fractional charges without success. Uh, uh, separately, there was a body of theory, the S-matrix theory, uh, with a number of elaborations, which dealt quite well with, uh, with the then known uh, scattering uh, cross-sections of various kinds. Uh, and among these, and I, I don't want to go into them in great detail, uh, was vector meson dominance. There, because of the uh, failure to, to identify isolated quarks in the various classes of experiments in which they had been searched for, the uh, proposition that nucleons were in fact constructed of quarks had a rather rough time. There was a s very small industry uh, that was that looked at the proposition and tried to calculate uh, nucleon properties and resonance properties based on the, uh, what, is, what was called, is called the constituent quark model. And the constituent quark model was to some extent different than the quarks uh, that were required for as the basis of the uh, classification schemes. Uh, the, and this, uh, this constituent quark model attracted very, very few uh, adherents and proponents. A, a few people persisted, uh, Dalitz, Morpurgo, and others, primarily dealing with uh, uh, low energy reactions of one sort or another uh, and hadron characteristics, but not, having, uh, not attempting to push these to uh, high energy, high momentum transfer reactions. The uh, reason that most of the theoretical community, I including incidentally some of its very distinguished members, uh, found that the, the theory of, con uh, the, the whole proposition of constituent quarks was unattractive was based, as I mentioned, partly on the idea that, that partly on the experimental evidence that nobody had produced them or seen them. Uh, also on the theoretical requirement that in order to be satisfactory in the models, they had to employ very, very uh, strong binding, which was upsetting 
and the uh, problem that while these things were expected to be spin a half, they had symmetric statistics, which was troublesome. And of course, the fractional charge uh, violated e every piece of experimental evidence that had uh, before that time been accumulated. Now, some of these uh, constraints were removed in some theories, but nevertheless, the aggregate of them made a constituent court picture quite unattractive, and it was generally not believed. Uh, one other thread uh, was the uh, set of theories called uh, current algebra. It, um, it was uh, initiated by Murray Gelman and uh, was a quite abstruse theory. The experimenters in, in our group, I, I think we generally f did not understand it really very well, and it did not play any real part in the, its predictions in the planning of our experiments. But uh, it did have one uh, current, so to speak, that affected us later. The, it, the, based on the current algebra ideas, there was started first by Adler and then Gross and Llewellyn Smith and others, a sum rule industry. And uh, Jim Bjork Kane, who was an old friend, became involved in that and used those techniques to predict something which I will come back to later called scaling. So to summarize the 1968 Hadron, we had, a, a, there was at best a rather cloudy idea of the dynamics. There was a quark model which was, whose successes were in the mathematical domain, but whose practical application as constituents was simply not really believed. Uh, there were a number of candidates, which, uh, theories which in principle would apply to the sorts of reactions we were about to study. One of them, as I mentioned, was vector meson dominance. Uh, Sam has talked about that, a heavy photon, if you like. Uh, the reason it was a live candidate uh, was because it had been quite successful in processes that involved real photons. And as I've noted on this view graph here, many people believed that it would succeed uh, in dealing with the virtual photons, uh, which we could adjust in our experiments to be quite far off the mass shell. Nevertheless, the expectation is that this process would uh, happily let us understand the uh, deep inelastic cross-section. And uh, one of the consequences of, of adopting this view was that it was not expected that one would see anything more than a continuously fuzzy proton and neutron. A couple of quotations on the possibility of real quarks being uh, constituents of nucleons and, and uh, other strongly interacting particles. It's a remark of Murray Gelman's, or uh, two remarks taken from a, phys rev, a physical, uh, physics letters paper of 1964, uh, in which it's quite clear from what he said that while he doesn't utterly reject the idea that there might be constituents in there. He certainly doesn't think that's the first uh, thing. That he's certainly not saying, well, I think they're there. Go look for them, folks. Quite the opposite. And an even stronger statement in Cockadee's book on the Quark model, in which he almost refers to the idea in scathing terms, referring to it as tentative and simplistic expression and ill-founded. Well, uh, so I think one could feel that we were not too badly off base designing equipment to study the rather low cross sections that uh, were expected on the uh, basis of the current, current thinking. But when we got to make the first inelastic measurements, we found something quite surprising. This is one of the first surprises and this is the earliest data in which we observed it. As a function of momentum transfer horizontally, two different cuts at two GeV inelasticity and three, you see the data uh, moving across here with hardly any momentum transfer dependence at all. And compared with this, 
just uh, arbitrarily normalized the consequences of elastic scattering and the enormous decrease in, in yield that is a, a consequence of the finite structure of the uh, aggregate proton when it is undisturbed in the elastic reaction. So this was certainly a discovery. And when the dust had settled and we had a chance to look around later and compare what our measurements were with what our earlier expectations had been, we found this, measurements that uh, were enormous, uh, predictions on which the experimental equipment had been based low. Uh, there's a factor of uh, uh, over 40 here. This was taken at a primary energy of 16 GeV, the primary electrons, at a scattering angle of 6 degrees. The, uh, such deviations become even more pronounced at larger momentum transfer. The second discovery was, uh, in a sense, it was directly suggested to us. I happened to be doing the data analysis at the time, so I was, uh, by chance, the fellow that first saw this. What happened was uh, we and I had been looking at the inelastic spectra, and here are six of them. Uh, at different, this is now plotted in a different way than the earlier graph. Uh, each of these spectra is at a constant momentum transfer, and it's plotted as a function of energy loss. These are the two independent variables that you have in principle available. And you can see on this plot that the data scatters around, and it, uh, you can take my word that if one extends the range of momentum transfer, the rest of this region in here eventually gets filled with data. And there's no obvious pattern in that. Uh, Jim Bjorkain came to see me one day, and in his rather gentle, hesitant way, he had something very powerful to say. He said, well, why don't you look at the data that you have accumulated as a function of a single variable, a combination of nu and q squared, and see whether this doesn't explain in a consolidated way what you are measuring. And I did that. There was one parameter in this that we did not at that stage know, had, not having any measurements of it. That was that quantity r that I mentioned earlier, the ratio of longitudinal to transverse. I took the data and plotted it for the two limiting cases, uh, r equal infinity and r equal 0. And uh, what happened was a, a spectacle, I mean, essentially under my eyes, this data consolidated into a compact universal curve uh, for either, either of the two limiting cases. And I remember at the time the, the little tingle I had looking at this, and I uh, recall thinking how Bohr must have, uh, not Bohr, but Balmer must have felt when with his empirical expression, whose origins he had no idea of, theoretically. He had found this, this a, a beautiful understanding of the series in the hydrogen atomic spectra. So it was clear that uh, B BJ had really gotten his hands on something here. And this, that was scaling. And this is the first plot that you see here, was the discovery of scaling in deep inelastic electron scattering. As time went on and as the program advanced, we got much better data. We were able to unscramble and separate the contributions from the two inelastic form factors that I mentioned. Each of them turned out indeed to be uh, a function of a single variable. I'll, I'll come to its specifications in a minute. But you see them here uh, uh, consolidating a wide range of nu and q squared in two relatively universal curves. Now, as the experiments continued and became more precise and we got more data, it was found that there were minor variations, uh, that this was not an absolutely strict rule. There was uh, some scale breaking, but it was a very, of a very small character compared to the gross scaling that was observed. 
So this uh, has ultimately become effectively uh, almost a law of nature. Now, to be specific about what uh, BJ had done, as I mentioned, based on uh, rather arcane uh, application of current algebra, he had predicted what is now bears his name, the uh, Bjorkane scaling and the Bjorkane limit. And to be specific, in the limit in which the energy uh, loss goes to infinity, the momentum transfer likely, likewise goes to infinity, that as this ratio is held fixed, 2m nu over q squared, that the quantity omega becomes the variable on which these uh, structure functions depend. I'll uh, pass over the lower part, uh, which is elaborated in this next slide, because it was not very long after those first measurements, where people were scratching their head over their meaning, that uh, Feynman came up to visit uh, us in the summer of 1964 and heard about these measurements. And he had been attempting to understand hadron-hadron interactions on the basis of a constituent model, not quarks, just constituents, parts of the proton, which he gave the uh, obvious name partons to. And uh, Feynman went down to his motel for the night after talking to uh, Jerry and others. And the next day, he came back uh, full of interest and excitement. And with the following picture, that the electron virtual photon was interacting with a parton, nature unknown. And the, uh, what one was, uh, one explained the large cross sections by the fact that these partons were assumed to be essentially point particles. That took care of that part of the paired discoveries. And second, that the scaling variable uh, came directly out of this picture because we were scattering elastically from a par a one or another of the particles in there, uh, which were point charge scatterings. Uh, the difference between scattering off of one of those and the proton being that, A, they carried some fraction, each of them, some fraction of the proton's mass, and they were in motion. And the scaling variable is, in fact, just that relation, which I, I showed you earlier, for elastic scattering from the proton with the single uh, proviso that you have a quantity in there, x, or, or it is an x, it represents a fractional mass, uh, which is that fraction of the momentum, uh, of the proton's momentum that the parton happened to be carrying when it was struck. And it is struck as a, uh, essentially a free particle. This is a picture that I happened to snap of Feynman when he came back late that fall. This is a muddy uh, Xerox of it, but there is a color picture over in the uh, Johnson Center where you can see it in better detail with his enormous vitality and interest. And in that October, he gave his first pu public talk on the parton theory, uh, the parton not yet being identified with quarks. It was a, a joy to see him operate. Uh, here is a little paragraph from the book he wrote where he put these things together uh, a few years later. Uh, those of you who, who knew him can, can uh, kind of visualize the enthusiasm he brought to it. I mean, look at the wording of this. An exciting adventure to try the idea that these things are simply quarks. And to uh, meet and surmount the then still outstanding obstacles to that interpretation. Well, the uh, experiments did not stop there. It was a program. It went on for a number of years. And the theorists, the, the, the stimulation of these results into the theoretical community uh, initiated a very interesting, almost fascinating interplay of theory and experiment, which went on for a number of years and eventually drawing in other laboratories with other confirming measurements. The uh, experiments, experimental results were themselves never challenged and were confirmed as other laboratories looked at uh, uh, similar analogous reactions. But the interpretations 
uh, took a long while to develop. It was like watching the grass grow. In total contrast to uh, Richter's discovery of the psi particle, the J psi, where at four in the morning very little was happening except a humdrum, uh, incrementally, uh, incremental studying of, of counting rates, and by eight o'clock they were breaking open champagne bottles and putting vodka in the orange juice. This is quite different in our case. But a few, uh, within a, a few years, Callan and, uh, no, very quickly, almost the same year, Callan and Gross showed that in the framework of this Feynman parton model, that you could begin to get a handle on the spins of the constituents, that uh, the, a particular combination of these form factors was one if the spin was a half, and zero if it was zero. And remember, the quarks were to be, uh, the mathematical quarks were to be spin one. And uh, very quickly, we had an experimental result. You see the red line is the prediction for spin a half. The green line is spin zero. And you have no problem deciding on that one. The vector meson dominance proposals didn't last very long either. Uh, they too uh, ran afoul of some measurements. Very soon we were able to de make determinations of R, not only uh, for the proton, but for the deuteron and by subtraction for the neutron itself. The vector de meson dominance or predictions uh, went up in here. There was some uncertainty of the angle, but uh, a strikingly different expected behavior than the data showed. And there went the vector uh, dominance models. Well, there, as I mentioned, there, th this interplay of theory and experiment continued on with more measurements uh, involving the uh, nucleon now, that is our deuteron and pro uh, neutron measurements. And let me just wind this down by going on a, a brief historical tour of what happened during the decade of the 1970s after the original discovery. I've, I've uh, told you about the early theoretical circumstances. Uh, SLAC itself had been proposed in the period when many of the resonances were being discovered for the first time. The classification schemes were in the early 1960s. Uh, uh, getting SLAC approved by the Congress was a fairly arduous problem. Uh, there was considerable opposition to it, uh, to some extent similar to what has happened with the uh, superconducting supercollider, but was indeed approved in 1961. The, uh, Joint collaboration between us and them started the following year. Uh, the shovels were out in 1963. The machine went on the air in 1967, uh, on time and within budget. And they essentially turned the switch, and it uh, came right up to beam. Uh, we just got used to that. <laughs> what else? That has not always happened in later times. In 1968, as I mentioned, the first deep inelastic proton scattering. Uh, very quickly, Feynman came in on that with the results I've discussed. Uh, those results were presented in Vienna that September. I've shown you the uh, slide of Feynman actually giving his first talk at SLAC. Uh, uh, Callan Gross and the determination of the spin uh, potential came in in November. The, uh, Bjorkain and Pascos were doing some rule evaluations uh, as part of his, uh, uh, BJ's work on current algebra. And 1969, the first, our first experimental results on R, and the first papers published that year. Then other laboratories uh, came in with the, on the basis of the general interest and excitement that had been generated. One of the predictions from the uh, parton theories was that the neutrino scattering data would show cross sections which increased linearly with the uh, primary energy. And CERN went back and looked at earlier data that they had taken on, on that reaction, on neutrino uh, cross sections, and discovered indeed 
that it increased linearly. So we were beginning to get outside uh, co uh, corroboration of the results. The following year, our electron deuteron uh, scattering uh, program started. And we very quickly discovered that the neutron proton ratio uh, was not one as a number of the earlier soft proton models suggested it might be, but uh, dropped dramatically. And by the latter part of that year, it was already clear that the parton model was beginning to be accepted, that the evidence was beginning to accumulate. Uh, by the following year, the NP ratio was uh, found to decrease dramatically down almost to a quarter. And the theoretical community simultaneously was beginning to focus more and more on the nature of the constituents, on the nature of the partons. There, there was a theory that Drell looked at, assuming they were uh, nucleons, if I remember. But uh, uh, Julius Cudi and Vicky uh, were beginning to look at the first of the quark models. The uh, dedicated neutrino experiments uh, were beginning to show results by late 1971, and the whole body of diffractive models uh, was beginning to be weeded out and discarded. And uh, later, uh, some of the more abstruse predictions of the uh, quark, what then became called the quark parton model, began to get uh, some experimental uh, verification. The uh, anti neutrino neutrino cross sections turned up to favor spin a half, as the uh, slack earlier results had done. Because the neutrinos have no charge, the uh, fractional charge peculiarities, which were inherent in the electron scattering cross section, did not affect the neutrino cross sections. So it was possible to make a, a, a cross determination to see whether the fractional electric charges were, in fact, what one was seeing in the slack yields. And lo and behold, the fractional charges turned out to uh, give predictions in agreement with the measurements. Uh, there was a, me uh, a confirming measurement of the a number of uh, valence quarks. Uh, we had found from some rule evaluations that we could not account for all of the momentum carried by the protons by looking at the sums over uh, cross sections. And it was concluded that at least some fraction, which looked like about half of the protons' momentum, was carried by entities with which the electrons did not interact. And these are, are now known as the gluons. So this is quite indirect measurement but, uh, determination, but that's where uh, gluons first s sort of started to show their head through the shrubbery. By 1973, uh, theoretical development by Pollitzer, Gross, and Wilczek uh, began to tell us how it was that we could conduct scattering from what appeared to be a free quark, and yet these things remained bound, uh, were not visible as free entities. That was a very important theoretical development. And then on the heels of that came the formulation of quantum chromodynamics. And uh, the beginnings of the understanding of the small, but, but quite clearly observed scale breaking uh, was that we were seeing. Well, you can look at the rest of these results. Uh, what we uh, go into through these subsequent years has been the subject of uh, a good deal of what Sam has been talking about and uh, earlier talks. And I think I don't have to go through that. But what happened over the rest of this decade was a slowly consolidating feeling that indeed the partons were quarks. A part of this was the uh, discovery of the J psi uh, and other things which you see. And by the time the decade had wound down, the 1968 
uh, uh, hadron was gone, was gone forever. And it was replaced by a nearly complete theory, quantum chromodynamics, which had by then been linked with the weak interaction theories, to form a, a theory which in principle one could calculate with and which entirely replaced what had been in place uh, before our experiments had started. Thank you very much.